Luke chapter number 12, if you have your Bible close at hand. If you don't have your Bible close at hand, there is a Bible in the seats in front of you nearby. Luke chapter number 12, we're going to be reading verses 13 through 21 tonight in our text tonight. We're in the midst of a series of any time that we see but God, and to see what all the scriptures have to say to us about the fact that there's something in the text that says, but God. So notice with me in Luke chapter number 12, verse number 13, it says, and, and one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge over, or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What should I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our message tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to learn from your word again. Father, may you use it in, in whatever way you would have for us, whether it is to be that of conviction, may you bring that to pass, whether it be just encouragement for us to continue doing the things we ought to do, may you bring that to pass. Father, we thank you so much for all that we have in your word, and may it be to us as gold and as silver and as precious stones as we look to you. May you open our eyes that we might behold the wonderful truths out of your word. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's a question just to start us off with tonight. This is just a rhetorical question, so I don't uh, anticipate anybody actually answering uh, as you're going to hear from the question itself. Um, the question is, what do we want other people to say about us after we pass away? So just think about it. Just think about it. We could get a lot of different answers there. What would we want other people to think about us after the fact that we pass away? It's an interesting thought, and a lot of people have uh, put in their thoughts, uh, and a lot of churchgoers would say, well, hopefully they could say that I was a good person. Hopefully they could say that I wasn't a cheat. Hopefully I, they, could, I, they could say that I wasn't lazy. Whatever attribute you might say about yourself, uh, I hope that they say that I was a loving father. That's what I hope. Uh, I hope that they, they can say that I uh, gave my all for the ministry. I hope that's one of the things that we think about. Uh, one person <laughs> jokingly said, uh, well, I know exactly what I would like to hear uh, people say at my funeral after I pass away at my funeral. I know what, exactly what I want them to say. Oh, look, I think I saw a hand move. <laughs> so uh, he says, I, I don't want to die at that point. So that was an unbeliever. So that was an interesting thing. One uh, person that said exactly what he wanted people to read after the fact of his uh, passing was that of D.L. Moody. Wonderful uh, evangelist in the 1800s and did a lot uh, of preaching throughout the world. And he said uh, this very famous quote. Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? 
At that moment I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all, out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. That was D.L. Moody. For all of us, I, I hope and pray that each and every one of us would be like that. I hope that they could say uh, that I did my best for the Lord. Now, here in this parable that we have before us, it's a very interesting one, and one that I'm going to look at as a reversal. Okay, what I mean by that is sometimes we can look at a person's life and take a lot of different um, lessons that are good and positive lessons from that person's life of, okay, I should be like this person. I should be like George Washington. I should be like, you know, Booker T. Washington. I should be like, and you fill in the blank. Oh, really good, positive role models. Then you have others. You look at their life and you say, wow, I hope I don't end up like, and you could put whatever name you want to put in there, whether it be that of like, Benedict Arnold. That's not a very happy story. Uh, one that I learned recently is that of Aaron Burr. He was the, pre the vice president of the United States. He went to become president versus him versus Thomas Jefferson. And because of Hamilton not liking Burr whatsoever, he didn't like Jefferson, but he really didn't like Burr. And so what he did was he gave a lot of bad press about Burr, so it helped Jefferson win the presidency. And so, of course, the story goes, Aaron Burr is so mad at Hamilton that he, he um, wanted to have a duel with him. And so he dueled with Hamilton. Of course, the gentleman thing to do in a duel is to take your gun and to shoot it right at the feet of your opponent, not to injure the person. But rather, Aaron Burr didn't really care much, and he took his gun and shot Hamilton, and the next, die, the next day, Hamilton had died. Interesting, Aaron Burr, at, from that moment, from all intents and purposes, from my own uh, American history learning in my own class, okay, learning about American history, I did not know the end of the story of Aaron Burr. Well, the end of the story is a lot worse. He decides to go into the newly purchased Louisiana Purchase, and he decided to try to get the Indians to get on his side in order to make a coup against the American government. And so he was trying to uh, kind of conquer our nation, as it were. And so he ends up very much penniless and friendless, uh, and he dies. And he, it is an amazing story of, okay, this is what you do not do. And you compare that with his grandfather, his grandfather was Jonathan Edwards. And so just the amazing polar differences here in, in that we see. Uh, so we need to understand this story. And the way that we're going to understand it is what did this person do uh, that we ought not to do? And then we're going to see the specific lessons that we should do. So notice with me, number one, the first lesson that we're going to learn from this man is that we need to be focused on God's will for our lives instead of our own. We need to be focused on God's will of, in our lives instead of our own. Notice with me in verse number 13 what it says. And one of the company said unto him, that's Jesus, Master, speak to my brother, and that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? So these two are at odds with each other. They're brothers. And because of the parents have passed away now, the inheritance is up for grabs. And now in the all reality, if the one was the older sibling back in those days, we have a more of an inheritance that will be given to that individual rather than the other brother. That's just how it worked back then. And so there was a bit of an argument between the two. And so they come to Jesus knowing, okay, so Jesus is a big, big name. He's going to be able to help with this situation. He's going to be able to say, okay, this is black and white, and so you need to get the inheritance, and you, yeah, you should be divided that way. Jesus, on the other hand, 
His mission is not for, okay, so who wants to be rich and who wants to be you know, less rich? Okay, no, that's not his mission whatsoever. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost spiritually. Spiritually, he wants to die and be made payment for all of our sins. That's why he came. He came to die for each and every one of us. So this, if you think about it eternally wise, you, you say, well, this inheritance one day is going to go bye-bye from you to your siblings, to your, to your family, to their family, to their family, and eventually it might disappear. There are so many different rich families that, that uh, their, their legacy, their inheritance, went from one generation to another and is no longer accessible, and now they're flipping burgers at McDonald's. Nothing wrong with flipping burgers at McDonald's. Somebody's got to do it, so it's, it's good. It's good. And so here's the thing about it, though. Jesus said, I'm not here for this reason. This is of no importance when thinking about eternity. And then he actually gets it down to the exact sin that the brothers had in, in front of them. So notice with me what it says here, verse number 15. He said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. That sounds like a fancy word. Covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. What covetousness is, is I have a desire to get something that I have not been given. Like, for instance, in the Ten Commandments, the number 10th commandment is simply do not covet, and it gives actually a list of all the things that you shouldn't covet. Literally, it is the next-door neighbor's wife. It is literally the next-door neighbor's stuff. It's literally, you know, if, for instance, if I was in my house and I saw our neighbor pull up and a nice looking, and one of my favorite cars is a DeLorean, even though they're not very good cars. I understand that. They're really cool looking, though. Uh, if, they, if my next door neighbor came and there's a DeLorean that was parked in their, in their um, driveway, I would say, hmm, well, isn't it nice to have one of those? <laughs> you know, if I'm not careful, I might design that over the things that I have been blessed with. God has blessed me with a 2011 Honda Odyssey. Praise the Lord. It's paid for. Amen. Uh, no, no debt there, so that's wonderful. Um, but yet that DeLorean, I might say, mm, I want that, and I'll do whatever I can in order to get that. In fact, I might steal that from my neighbor. And of course, it's not a very good thing as a neighbor to do that. So uh, interesting. That desire for more and more and more and more, that is this, this sin of covetousness. The fact of I can't, I can't get enough. Henry Ford once said, uh, how much, he was once asked the question, how much do you need to be happy? One more dollar. One more dollar. One more dollar. In all reality, just because a person is rich doesn't make that per person apps, uh, actually happy. And so one, one person that, that uh, I said that to, they said, well, I like to try at least. You know, <laughs> I would like to give me the opportunity to do it at least and find that out myself. But here's the thing about it, that happiness will never be bought for. Happiness will never be that of I have I own this therefore I'm happy no it's okay I own this but that came out just recently that's the brand new edition of it ooh I might want to have the brand new edition now and then it goes on and on and on and on and so the fact that Jesus says Beware, take heed, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then he gives this story. So notice with me, first of all, we're going to see once it, this lesson be focused on God's will instead of our own. Notice with me what it says here. He says in verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. Now, notice with me how many times the word will is there. Okay, um, 
this will I do. I will put, pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take, eat, ease, and eat, drink, and be merry. So many times, I will do this, I will do that. No, no, it's according to God's will whether or not we do. I love what the book of James says about it. Go to now, ye, ye that say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, what, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But notice this, but now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. I never really pondered that portion of it. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, today I'll do this. Now that's you know, for the Lord's will. But all such boasting is evil. So it's all about the will of God. What is God's will for my life today? What is my will? What is God's will for my life tomorrow? In what manner should I spend my time tomorrow? It's an amazing thing. Time is a, a, a wonderful tool that God has given each and every one of us. And an amazing thing that God has given each and every one of us the same amount. Whether it be, you know, we have 24 hours a day. We have 60 minutes in an hour. Don't ask me to do the math of how much minutes is in the day. I wouldn't be able to do it on the spot. But you think about it, we all have the same amount of time in the day. And so the question is, do we actually want to know what God's will for us that day is, or do we not? I love one person said that uh, a, a great joke is to tell God our plans, and he will laugh at us. So, <laughs> so amazing. God has such a wonderful plan for our lives that even goes beyond what we ever can comprehend. And we think about all the different biblical examples that is that they thought one way, but yet God showed them another. You think about Ezekiel. He was going to be a priest, but Nebuchadnezzar happened, and so God made him actually a prophet in the midst of a foreign land. We see Moses was, con was consent to be a shepherd when God had told him, you're going to be uh, the shepherd of my people. Saul of Tarsus wanted to eradicate all the Christians from the face of the earth, but God helped him to see the light. Peter was a fisherman until the Lord made him a fishers of men. And then you think about David. Uh, when I was listening and to uh, one Chuck Swindoll message about David, one thing that he brought up is the, the possibility of the reasoning why he was the last one thought of when Samuel came. He said there's a possibility that David was born out of wedlock, which I don't know if that's true, but that would be interesting to, to find that out. And he, he made the declaration of, okay, it might be this. But you think about it, no one thought much of David, yet God made him a king. So it doesn't matter exactly our plans for our own lives, because a lot of times God changes our desires at times. God changes the will that we have. God changes our situations at times. You know, I don't know how many of you thought of it when you were children, but the question was always asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? That was always the, the question that was asked, and I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I was, you know, 10, or 8, 9, 10. I knew exactly what I was going to be. I was going to be the best comic book writer in the world. That was what I was going for. That is exactly what I wanted to be. And then when I became 12, 13, and 14, I decided, oh, forget the comic book writing. I'm going to be a concert violinist. And so, true enough, I did pick up my violin uh, once, just because for this vacation time, because I said I would. Now, did I play it? No. <laughs> 
I realized I need a little little tuning uh, with my violin, so uh, I did not actually got to play. Actually, it was during the time when I was cleaning my closet, now, to be honest. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I should probably get it out. Oh, string's out of place, so okay, I won't deal with that right now. So, uh, But yeah, I was going to be a concert violinist. But yet then God took a hold of my heart and said, no, I want you for the ministry. And I said, okay, Lord, whatever your will is, that is what will be done. We see all the different different examples of this. William Carey was a cobbler, a shoemaker, not a dessert. <laughs> I always thought, cobbler, dessert. I got hungry. Uh, but it was actually a shoemaker that he was. Um, but God got a hold of him, and he became a missionary to India. We see C.T. Studd was a professional cricket player, but God got a hold of him, and he became a missionary to India, China, and Africa. It was him that, po that penned the poem that we all have quoted from time to time. Here's, here's a bit of his poem. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It's all about the will of God, not my will. I love what Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, not my will, but thine be done. I love what John the Baptist said about Jesus in John chapter number three. He says that I must decrease and he must increase. And that should be all of our heart's desires is I will decrease as Jesus in me increases. We are to be in conformed to them more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And all of our desires, all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our will should be like his own. So first of all, be focused on God's will instead of our own. Number two, we need to be content with what God gives us. Notice with me back in our passage here, exactly what is he wanting more? So notice with me, verse 16 it says, the ground of a certain rich man, so already he's wealthy. Already he has enough to survive. But then move on. Brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, is it wrong for him to have more and more and more? The answer is, it depends. It depends about his own heart. Why does he want more? Well, the answer there is, well, we see that he just wants to take it easy for the rest of his life. He doesn't want to work anymore. Now, I understand that that is the, the reasonable thing about uh, the reason why we have a retirement fund and you know, IRAs and, and all these wonderful things. You know, one day, I hope that if I'm not able to do what I'm doing right now, I'll be able to live off of uh, the retirement funds. But and here's the thing that's very interesting about our, our uh, culture is that a lot of people want to just retire in order to do nothing. They retire to go and sit down and watch TV all day. Well, that's kind of a waste of your time, I would say. You know, you know, just thinking about all the things that God has saved us in order to, for us to be more and more like Christ and all the things that we could do with our time, that should be on the, the very low about what we do. Being content is what is a great thing. We need to have a retirement fund. Okay, that, that's wonderful to have an emergency fund or a rainy day fund. I know it's raining outside, so that's a wonderful blessing that we're inside and not out. Um, but be content with what God gives us. This man is not content until he has more and more 
and more. Notice with me, actually, a few different scriptures to talk about covetousness. One of my favorite verses here is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, which we all know as the promise that he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But a lot of times we like to take that out of context. Here's the actual verse that it's in. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, let your conversation or lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for or because he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's in the connection of being content with what God has given us that he himself is our great reward. He himself is the one that our heart should be uh, looking and longing for. Not more and more stuff, not more and more money, not more and more uh, wealth or, or anything that we might buy, but rather it's God himself. We see in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 5, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor uh, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. I love what 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content contentment is a wonderful attribute that all of us need to have in our culture it's so hard though because guess what is on tv if you watch any bit of tv i'm sure you have seen commercials you know i praise the lord for any time that we could skip commercials that that is a wonderful thing streaming services sometimes you could get away without having commercials whatsoever but here's the thing about it why are those commercials there so it gets you to desire to buy whatever's on the screen. Like, for instance, I see every once in a while an ad for a new taco at Taco Bell. How many of you like Taco Bell? Okay, a few of us. Okay, good. I'm not alone here. And so looking and, and seeing that taco, I think, boy, that would probably taste pretty good. Boy, I should probably think about going there and getting that exact thing. Why? What is it doing to me with my eyes when it affects my heart so that I want and desire whatever it is on the screen? But here we ought to be very careful about that when it comes to our lives that we are not always longing for something else when if we have Jesus Christ, he is everything we need. He is everything that we ever should long for. To see the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of glory, we sh that should be our one desire in our lives. It should. And true enough, looking at the world around us and seeing all the different things happening, it's amazing all the things that, you know, if, if I were to say, okay, so this is what the scripture says about end times, what does it look like in our world today? Well, this is kind of matching up to be exactly what I think is going to happen. Now, sure enough, we believe the pre-tribulational rapture is very close. That means when Jesus comes back before the tribulation happens, we're caught up with him in the air, ever to be with the Lord. Amen. And so we praise the Lord for that, and we see uh, things are happening in the world today. So I wouldn't be too surprised if it is within my own lifetime that the rapture happens. Now, true enough, 2,000 years of church history has said the otherwise. But uh, think about this. Every day we need to be ready. And what a wonderful way to be ready is for us to be longing after the sight of Christ. We already sang about uh, seeing his beautiful smile seeing his beautiful face. And there's nothing uh, that we can see here on earth that will ever match that what we will have in heaven. And looking and noticing that, just amazing. Be content with what we have. And number three, the third lesson that we see here in this text is be generous with what God gives us. Be generous with what God gives us. Now, notice with me what he says here. Uh, in verse number 16, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. 
And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to where to bestow my fruits? Stop right there. I know probably of a way you can get rid of your fruits, sir, and you're still rich, because you're still automatically rich no matter what you do. But here's what you do. Whatever is left over, why don't you give that to the poor? Why don't you give that to the less fortunate instead of harping on yourself more and more and more wealth? That's not what he ought to do. Notice with me what it says here, and after he talks to himself and says, that's a good plan, verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, it's an amazing thing. You can give all your wealth to the church, and if you have never received Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you will die and go to an eternal hell. Why? Because Not because of, oh, I did this one good work, but rather because of all the nasty sins that we have committed in our lives. Jesus Christ came into the world to be made sin for us so that we can be made the righteousness of God in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in a nutshell. We are not deserving to go to heaven no matter what kind of good works we ever can ever try to achieve in our own lifetime. It will not be that which exceeds that of our sin. The amount of sin that you think that you have in your life is much more than what you think. It is much more, I'll say the word damning, but in the right context. Every single sin that we ever ever committed shows us that we do not belong in heaven. But rather, if we leave this world without Jesus Christ, then we will go to a literal hell, a literal place of torment, a place that God does not want anybody to go to except for the devil and his angels. But God so loved you. Every single person that is hearing my voice right now, he loved you enough to send his own son to be brutally treated, to be hung on a cross, and put upon him the sin of all humanity, so that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and him alone for our salvation, then he gives us eternal life. He gives us his, himself. He that has the Son has everlasting life, but he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. So the thing about it is that you can give everything you got to the poor, but it still will not make a difference because your sin is still not atoned for unless you're in Christ. So put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you have not, never done so yet, put your faith on tonight. We need to be generous with what God gives us. God has given us his all, and so should we give our of our substance to him. And think about in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 7, it says, Every man ac according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. If a person says, oh, the church, all, all they want is my money. Well, no, I don't, I don't really want your money. If you're, if you're, if you're not going to give it joyfully, don't give it. <laughs> Here's a pastor saying, okay, if you're not going to do it in the right way, I'd rather you not give. Get your heart right, and then you want to give. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And we see that God wants us to be cheerful. The, the word cheerful there is uh, the word hilarious. To be have such a joy, such a want and desire that you're so joyful that, yes, I get to give again. All right. Okay. Tithe, no problem. Here's 10%. Here. Here's 20%. Here's 30%. Any takers? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Here's a wonderful story about somebody giving. And uh, so this man uh, in the late 1800s, he owned a soap factory uh, soap company in New York. And he said, no matter what happens, I'm going to give 10% to God 
whenever I get any money in. When I get a, a paycheck, 10% right away. And so he started doing that. And more, and more and more he does that, the more God blessed him and his company. And then he said, well, I can now do 20%. Okay, now I could do 30%. Okay, now I can do 40%. He finally, he got to 50%. He gave away half of what God had given to him, and he's still making more and more and more money. Today, we know of his company. Some of us own his products. His name was William Colgate, and uh, Colgate Palm Olive Company is around today, and that originally was his company. And so as an example about giving, and God loves a cheerful giver and so not only do we be generous in with what god gives us but number four last but not least be about the lord's business because everything else will burn up be about the lord's business because everything else will burn up notice with me what he says verse number 20 but god said unto him thou fool this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not, notice this, rich towards God. How do we become rich towards God? Well, it's receiving Christ as our own personal Savior, but understanding that one day we're going to be coming before a judgment seat. This judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ, one day all the Christians are going to come before. And what's going to happen is whatever we do here for him, that will be taken and everything that we've done, everything that we said will be put together and made into some sort of structure and he's going to light it on fire. And he said if it's made of wood, hay, and stubble, the things that don't last, the things that don't matter and if a fire hits it, it's gone. Like if this building was made purely out of wood, hay, and stubble, and a fire broke out, guess what we'll need? We'll need a tent in order to be you know, having services again. But he said, gold, silver, and precious stones, those are the things that if the fire hits it, it's, what it's only going to do is purify it. And so the wood, hay, and stubble are the things that don't matter in this life. The, the things that once we come into eternity, these are the things that will make no hill of beans about. There is nothing about it that is worth anything. But then we have the gold, silver, precious stone. This is the things that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the prayers that we pray for each other. These are, this is the time that we spend in our, the Word of God and let God's words shape us and inform us and convict us of sin and help us to turn from the things that we wanted to do in our flesh, but yet now we're going more and more into the Spirit. We have a judgment seat, a reward time for all believers in Christ. There is also a judgment seat for those who are lost, the great white throne judgment. And it's there that uh, those who have never received Christ as their Savior, they will come, they have to give an account for their sins and be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. For all intents and purposes, what we ought to be about is our Father's business. Otherwise, we're going to be like this man. And, you know, it, it's an amazing thing, uh, I'm sure somebody in my life has called me a fool, um, but I don't know if God has ever called me a fool, and that's a rough thing to go through is, you fool. Ouch. For us, we ought to be about our Father's business. We ought to be about eternity and the things that truly matter. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this night you have given us. We thank you for all that you have shown us by the way of your word. And Father, I ask you to be with each person here. If there's anybody that is hearing the sound of my voice that is not saved, may you help them to receive Christ as their own personal Savior. Father, we ask you to be with each one that are in Christ. We ask you to help us to be more and more about you, longing and 
desiring for the coming of Christ. Longing and desiring to do your will above our own. Show us what you have us to do this week and help us to do it. I do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your hymnal. We'll have one more hymn for tonight. Hymn number 72. We're actually going to.